definitely some sort of a homemade hot chocolate um, built around cacao, reishi, and mukuna, and then adding spices and sweeteners of your choice for additional health benefits. Welcome to the Food Matters Podcast, your home for health and wellness. My name is James Colhoun, filmmaker and founder of foodmatters.com, and I am your host on this journey to inner and outer transformation. Before we dive into today's episode, I want to take a short moment to talk to you about the Food Matters Nutrition Certification Program, because studying nutrition completely changed my life. It helped me to heal my father get him off six different medications, lose 50 pounds and completely regain and transform his life and health. But the problem is, is that we're not really taught about nutrition in our schooling system. The medical profession is rarely pronouncing the facts of using nutrition as medicine. And we have a fast food industry that thrives off misleading consumers. So if you're looking to learn about how to use nutrition as medicine to either heal yourself or a loved one or help prevent chronic disease, or you wanna take that next step on your study and nutrition journey and become a certified nutrition coach, then the Food Matters Nutrition Certification Program is for you. This is a 10 week or self-paced, internationally accredited certification program designed to take you through some of the most important topics and the latest research when it comes to nutrition and natural healing, including gut healing, autoimmune conditions, balancing hormones naturally, detoxification, biochemical individual approaches to nutrition, plus it brings together the best that we know about uh, nutrition science and anthropological research and bringing these two approaches together to help you cut through the confusion about what to eat and what to avoid for optimum health. To find out more about the nutrition certification program, plus to download your curriculum guide, head to foodmatters.com forward slash study. You can pause this right now. It will only take you 30 seconds. That's foodmatters.com forward slash study, or you can head to the show notes for more information. Have a beautiful day. Hey guys, it's James here from Food Matters. And today I'm going to be speaking with a dear friend of mine that I've known for many years. And we're going to be talking about how to use mushrooms and super herbs in your daily routine to restore your immunity and your gut health. It's such a big topic. He is a passionate expert when it comes to mushrooms in particular and founder of one of my favorite companies in the u.s called four sigmatic if you're in the health space and you haven't heard of this company you're probably hiding under a rock or in some like bunker somewhere but this company was the first to bring mushrooms and coffee together making it a more of a healthified experience bringing these adaptogenic functional mushrooms into people's morning routines so super cool if you haven't tried it yet check it out He's also just uh, written a book called Healing Adaptogens. I want to make sure I get the title right here. The Definitive Guide to Using Super Herbs and Mushrooms for Your Body's Restoration, Defense, and Performance. And it's with a publisher that I love. We've just done a book with them as well, Food Matters Cookbook it's with Hay House. So jump on their website and check out the book. Tero, dude, how you doing? Thanks for uh, having me on. It's I feel like it's a beautiful way to reconnect. Uh, we were just before we started recording talking about when was the last time we met in person. And it's been a few years given everything that's gone on. And it was great to hear of all the beauty and success you've created during those times. Thank you. Um, it's been a wild ride and it's been a ride that we've likely needed to connect in with our health more. Many people have followed that thread When it comes to this topic we're going to talk about today, so adaptogens, people might not know much about that, or or herb or herbal medicine, I'm sure, uh, functional mushrooms, yes. I believe you had some experience as a child with this that spurred your interest in creating not only this book, but also, of course, this company for Sigmatic. Uh, Talk me through what was this, this impetus for you. Yeah, I grew up in Finland on a family farm that we've had since 1619. So me and my brother are now the 13th generation managing the farm. And uh, my mom taught physiology and anatomy and my dad was an agronomist. So I learned about farming and forest from my dad and then food and science and nutrition from my mom. And uh, I studied chemistry and nutrition myself and then... um, about 20 years been studying uh, 
uh, adaptogens and a little more than that on fungi. And uh, my passion was, as a kid, was to become a professional athlete. Um, I was never that good, but my friends were. So I started coaching professional athletes very young, at a very young age. Um, and uh, and been on that journey to find ways to like optimize human performance and longevity. And, and uh, here we are, uh, a little over 20 years later. Nice. And what was it about mushrooms in particular that perked your interest like did it did they like did you experience them did you experiment with them was it for performance was it you know were you just using it in general nutrition and culinary arts i mean i'm sure mushrooms are a big part of culinary tradition in in finland as well yeah for sure uh, i grew up with them foraging them my mom taught me to how to forage them when i was yay high and they're a big part of our culture uh but for human optimal performance and nutrition purposes I never chose mushrooms. They chose me. It's not like I grew up like I want to do a mushroom business, but instead it was more like a gradual progression uh, for a few reasons. One is that it's one of the areas where I feel like I'm always humbled and I keep learning new things, whereas some other areas of nutrition, you, after a few years of studying, you kind of peek out uh, and then you just kind of try to update with the latest and greatest research. But with fungi, I was always learning. Um, Secondly, it was, um, if I looked at any of the big system that I felt was wrong with nutrition, fungi was always one of the answers. So it was in like my top three toolbox. And then when I explained the toolbox to different people, people were always shocked about fungi's existence in that toolbox. It was always the most shocking. So I feel like the world needed to learn more about mushrooms. So there was also a huge need because not many people understand fungi even still today but there's been a huge improvement over the last five ten years on that topic so that's kind of brought me back but it's not like as a kid i dreamed of being a a fun guy uh myself but it was gradual progress and then and i keep learning and learning and it's 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 like uh it's a real rapid hole like an alice in the wonderland just going deeper and deeper yeah that's awesome so with with mushrooms, like one of the things you talk about, well, it's the title of your book, um, you use this term adaptogens. What does that mean exactly for people that are new to this term? And, and how does it impact the body when you're taking some of these, these functional mushrooms? Yeah, adaptogens are natural substances that help your body to adapt to stress. Um, it is about a 70 year old term. It's very much evidence-based. So adaptogen term is based out of modern science. Um, but the substances that are adaptogens have been used for hundreds, if not thousands of years around the world by different ancient cultures. They're often well-documented anywhere from Ayurveda to uh, TCM. Um, but the definitions for adaptogens set 70 years ago by the first group of uh, researchers and doctors using them is is that they need to be safe and non-toxic so they can be used on a regular basis. Surprisingly, many herbal medicines cannot, but they need to be cycled, used seasonally. Secondly, they restore balance in body, um, meaning they're not sedative or stimulative, where surprisingly many products are one or the other. And then finally, they impact multiple body systems. So they're not a sniper rifle, but they're a general support for holistic health. And, um, and yeah, they're, uh, it's a real term. It's not like a word superfood, which is, I like the word superfood, but it's a total marketing word. Um, it's not based on any science and European Union doesn't like accept the word superfood because like all food is super, but adaptogen is accepted and it's, you know, it's a real scientific term although most people don't understand it and it is used incorrectly in marketing as well Mm. when when it came to like i'd like to know this this idea too like where you got the idea to put mushrooms with coffee because coffee can typically for some people be a little bit of a stressor right it it can elevate the heart rate you know it can it stimulates the body and some people were more sensitive. Like I know Laurentine, for instance, cannot even have a cup of coffee at all. She does not drink it. It just sets her off. So did you think, well, if I put these adaptogens in there, it's going to modulate the effects of the coffee? What, what, was, what was the idea? 
Yeah, uh, the inspiration came from my ancestors. So Finnish people drink more coffee than any other nation in the world, which is surprising. About It's like three times more than Americans. So if you're in, in Melbourne, Australia or New York City, it's surprising that there is these weird Finns in Northern Europe who drink even more coffee. But uh, Nordic people drink a lot of coffee. And during Second World War, we were attacked both by the Germans and the Russians, and we ran out of coffee beans and there was a shortage. So we started brewing a mushroom we had used for a long time because it tasted like coffee. It was called chaga, C-H-A-G-A. And then after the war, when people had reported good feelings, the University of Helsinki started studying the effects of that chaga. So that's where the inspiration came. But let's talk about the health benefits. Coffee is actually really, really good for you. And there is there is amounts of studies on coffee that most foods don't have. So there's meta studies, studies of studies on the health benefits of coffee, particularly for longevity. Coffee is one of the greatest foods for brain and general heart longevity. That being said, it has two major downsides, and these are real downsides. First of all, it's tough for digestive system, especially the acidity of coffee can really upset people. You can get like, Things like, um, you know, like heartburn, for example, or other forms of distress. And then it's a, it's a central ne- uh, nervous system stimulant. Um, it's not the only mechanic of action. The, it also triggers the dopamine system. And there's a there's a kind of tiredness receptor and endocene that it impacts. But it does stimulate the central nervous system. And that can cause some people jitters. There's two kinds of enzymes how we... Um, process caffeine but i digress the main point is that you can use mushrooms and adaptogens to combat these two negative downsides first of all for the acidity chaga is very high in minerals and it's very like uh, alkaline so and it tastes fairly similar so you can take half coffee half chaga or whatever ratio you want to use meaning it'll lower the acidity make it more stomach friendly these functional mushrooms and adaptogens are very good for digestive system and secondly they have different cognitive and um and energy supporting functions where you can use them to lower the dose of the caffeine um and support for example your endocrine system versus things like caffeine can be very taxing for things like the adrenals so the end result is something that tastes like coffee but is a lot softer and regenerative for your body Nice. Yeah, I, I love the blends and they're really convenient. You can take them in a small sachet. I thought that was a really great innovation because a lot of people do travel and it's an awesome way for people to just put it in some uh, clean, warm water. And if they like, add add a milk of choice. Um, if we had to talk through like some of your favorite functional mushrooms, because I do see that the blends have different mushrooms, like like you said, the chaga, chaga for alkalinity and supporting the gut health but if you had to choose your favorite functional mushrooms and some of the benefits that they impart on human health what would they be yeah i mean the most studied for human health is reishi mushroom and it's known as the queen of all mushrooms um it was already in the first materia medica and traditional chinese medicine ranked as the number one herb even though it is a mushroom and uh, it's incredible for many different health benefits uh, besides immunity and gut health i one of the reasons why i love it it's very grounding for the endocrine system so hba axis it's it's very kind of for stress support amazing evening time supporting with deep sleep so reishi would be number one so if you're in doubt and you've not tried any of these, that's usually the one where you would start. Um, the chaga and the lion's mane that are used with the coffee most commonly are also very beautiful. Chaga is known as the king of the mushroom, grows in a birch tree, kind of including in Finland. And then lion's mane is used very commonly as a natural nootropic or kind of a smart drug. Um, so it's it's amazing for a brain nervous system. Um so those would be probably top three. If I would have to choose a fourth one, it would probably be cordyceps for athletic performance and physical performance, probably. Nice. That's cool. Yeah, I've been, um, since I've been back in Australia, just uh, for the you know last couple of months, I've been going to a farmer's market and buying fresh lion's mane. And it's such an exciting mushroom to cook with. You know, it's this, like, it looks like a head, you know, we talk about in nutrition, this doctrine of signatures, we have like a heart, 
and it's four, I mean, tomato, which is like four chambers. It looks like a heart and lycopene, obviously walnuts and the brain and celery and bone health and, and carrots, increasing blood flow to the eyes. But when you look at lion's mane, you're like, that has to be good for your brain or your hair because it just looks like someone's taken their scalp off, right? Yeah, and that's same true with reishi uh, kind of also has a little bit of a heart shape. And then cordyceps looks like um, a male reproductive organ, penis, and it's used for, uh, its nickname is cordyceps. So I think that's very true for a lot of, at least it gives us some indications of like doctrines of signatures. So kind of like tips and, and guidance on what something could be used for. Yeah, nice. So as we sort of transition just strictly out of mushrooms here because we we have other podca- podcasts i'm sure you know ali schaefer she's been on the podcast and talked about functional mushrooms but but let's more talk about adaptogens which is where your book goes deeper into what are some other adaptogens that you talk about in the book in terms of uh you know top recommendations that you would have for people if they're looking to boost immunity and improve gut health in particular yeah, I mean, there's a there's a lot of famous adaptogens, and then there's less famous adaptogens. So famous adaptogens could be things like ginseng, turmeric, uh, maybe ashwagandha these days. Ashwagandha, a lot of people know it. In the United States, ashwagandha has surpassed green juice in Google search volume. So it's not an easy word to spell out. So the fact that it exceeds green juice is pretty impressive. Um, but for gut health specifically and immunity, um, Besides what we mentioned, I really like turkey tail. It's it's used as uh, a form of it is used as a popular cancer drug in Japan, particularly used for like breast cancer. Um, we don't promote it for that purpose, but that's an extract of it. PSK and PSP are used in Japan for that purpose. But for us in the West, we can still benefit its immunomodulatory benefits um, for just general well-being and occasional immune support. Um, Eulithero, which is also known as Siberian ginseng, would be another interesting product um, for immunity. It's a root. Um, it's not really a ginseng. It's not part of the ginseng family, but it is one of the kind of first ever studied adaptogens. Uh, and besides gut health protection, is interesting for brain power and physical stamina, particularly in long endurance feats. Um, and I, I think those are interesting. But I want to say that there's two parts about the, the immunity part that gets often overlooked. And that's one is that we talk a lot about microbiome. So our kind of bacterial grounds in our gut and also, by the way, in our skin, we have a lot of bacterial. But the, there's also a microbiome. So both in our skin and our gut, we will have fungi no matter what. Mm. So even if you never consume fungi, you will have fungi in your gut. So bacteria and fungi live together. And some of them are friendly. Some of them are not friendly. So think of candida or mold as a non-friendly one. And then there's many positive fungi in our gut. And that gets often overlooked. And you want to feed that positive. And that's a huge unlock into um into gut health. And then second part is the connection with the brain. We've often heard about the gut brain connection and that's very real into the point of mental health. So I believe something like 50% of dopamine and something like, I think, is it 80% of serotonin is created in the gut. And a lot of the cognitive function boosting benefits are somehow related to gut health and vice versa. So when we look at things like adaptogens, we can look at it through an isolated system like the digestive system. We have 11 systems in our body. Um, so think of like reproductive system, skeletal system, uh, nervous system, circulatory system. So we can just focus on the digestive system, but particularly the digestive system, immunity and brain power are very much a trifecta. Uh, there's huge impact on each one to the other one. So I would, I would, uh, if I would work on my gut, I would absolutely broaden it to, um, to include immune supporting products and uh, brain promoting products. Nice. When, when you talk about, I mean, I've heard, you know, Paul Stamets, he talked about using turkey tail with his wife, I think it was, or mother that had cancer, mother actually. And, um, there's, reported use of that anecdotally so i find that's interesting when when it comes to 
functional mushrooms or even like turkey tail even, or if we look at the adaptogens like ashwagandha, like you said, which is crazy that it's overtaken green juice's search term. It is difficult to spell. What's your favorite like format for taking them? Do you prefer like a powdered format or a liquid format with um, in an is suspended in an alcohol or you know what, what do you suggest people do and, and and what's the best way you find to to take it? Short answer is powdered extracts for most. Um, I do tinctures at home because I know exactly what goes into them. But most commercial tinctures are a little bit of a black box from the amount of active ingredients. So we don't really know the concentration of the extract. Um, we don't know, at, and we don't kind of know what we're taking. And so they're um, a very much prone to marketing hype. And also you are consuming alcohol or glycerin and so you will have somewhat negative, you know, binders or other ingredients. And then um, instead, when you take powdered extracts, uh, the best ones are standardized to a certain concentration. And I would also avoid capsules and pills. There's a lot of enzymes and digestive process that starts when we taste our medicine. So I would recommend tasting it. And by the way, with capsules, um, it's especially good to taste them for quality purposes. A lot of these substances, most of the adaptogens and fungi are very bitter and unpleasant to, uh, so if you open the capsule and it doesn't taste bitter, it probably means it's not a high quality product. If it tastes like grains or rice or something mild, then you probably know that you're not getting any of the health benefits because a lot of these triterpenes, polysaccharides, saponins, polyphenols are very either bitter or, earthy or you know of other kind of strong flavor profile so um i like to consume it in some way i taste it and in a powdered extract form for most most of these substances but in my book i kind of go exact dosing based on studies exact format and how you would even formulate with it so i i try to go we went through over a thousand research papers with my co-author to just kind of break it down for everyone exactly but that would be like the blanket statement nice i like that yeah a lot of people like for instance are not familiar with like opening a capsule so just fyi you can take it and sort of twist it and it'll open up and you can dump the uh the the contents out i mean david wolf first got me into this when he was having me put like probiotics into like watermelon juice to make like watermelon kefir mm -hmm. and like all sorts of like fermented thing so that was um that was sort of fun and i think you touched on an interesting point about bitterness like there's this um you know this term bitter medicine you know yeah. and it's it, there there is a lot of medicine in the bitters do you find that typical of mushrooms typical of 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 these adaptogens they have this sort of bitter component in the flavor profile yeah, and the, I guess the technical term is xenohormesis, so particularly used for plants, but I think applies as well to functional mushrooms. So basically, these plants and fungi and adaptogens, they build certain compounds to protect themselves against stressors. So a lot of the best adaptogens grow in high altitude or some other extreme environment, and they are attacked by bugs and weather, and they build these stressors they have stressed themselves and from that stress they create compounds that then when we ingest actually creates stress so the weird fact about let's say even like lectins is actually like good like it's kind of weird to understand but as long as you you bring it in at moderate dosages you actually build your body to be stronger so it's like a boot camp or like a hit workout or lifting heavy weights and it will build your tolerance. So in the case of adaptogens, it's like a lot of these like saponins or phenols, like they actually like trigger kind of a, they attack the body in a friendly way. Well, think of like turmeric and the curcumin, especially when combined with black pepper or piperin, then, then kind of like creates this like spicy attack on the body, but then it triggers positive responses, the body to become stronger. So. I mean, yeah, I mean, anywhere from common allergens that I wouldn't necessarily recommend consuming, like wheat mm -hmm. and soy and other things, but the whole body responds to these triggers. And if 
without these triggers, the body will be weak and fragile. So um, the good news with adaptogens is that they're not common allergens and you can use them and they support gut health, but they are definitely, um, they're definitely like, sti- like not stimulating, but they're eliciting a response from body that will make the body stronger, such as like with the functional mushrooms, like activating natural killer cell act- activity and therefore supporting your immunity. Mm, that's really cool. Yeah. Th- I mean, it's quite, it's growing in popularity, this idea of these like hormetic stresses, right? I mean, when I interviewed uh, Wim Hof a few years back for our Transcendence uh, docuseries, you know, he's the perfect example of using hormetic stresses, right? Like putting the body under stress, testing it, and then letting it expand and grow in its capacity. And there's literature on this as well, where kings would be given small amounts of poison on a frequent basis so that if they were, you know, poisoned by a, a warring faction or tribe, they would have built up some resilience to this, uh, to this toxin. So that's a really uh, profound idea. I guess maybe on this thread, I mean, hormetic stresses is like a, a scientific thread and things like cold showers or small amounts of lectins, which I, I love that idea too, because I think eliminating all things that stress the digestive system or body is not a good idea. You're going to end up in this like, um, what's it, what's this drink? Soylent green sort of like smoothie with no chewing, mm-hmm. you know, <laughs> laying on your back. Uh, yeah. So I think, I think it's important that we stress the system, right? I mean, what, what other ways do you stress your system apart from putting these adaptogenic herbs in and spices? What else do you do? Yeah, um, I'll actually start with that. I'm a huge fan of Wim Hof. I'd say probably like you, we've had the luxury of meeting a lot of the leading health and wellness experts in the world. And, and uh, once you get to know them, you some are more legit or hardcore than others. And I think Wim has always been a person I've only met him a few times, but is just the real deal. And actually just before starting this podcast did a four minute, um, ice bath. Uh, I needed some energy in the, in the afternoon, evening here. So, um, yeah, I love doing cold exposure. And as a Finnish person, sauna is another thing. Um, so sauna is the only Finnish word in English language. So, uh, heat exposure. So anywhere exposing myself to elements is really powerful. So I have a, a 18 month old child and as part of his upbringing after breastfeeding, we started giving him um, small micro amounts of weed and egg and soy and different kinds of nuts, cashews that are all kind of like possible allergens. And, and I think that was also a good example for me to realize that every now and then consuming, especially plant substances, that are suboptimal for a digestive system, especially when I'm traveling, is actually probably really good for you. So it sounds really weird, but especially when traveling in foreign countries, I try to expose myself to dirt, bacteria, and the various plant foods that make me stronger and not make me sick. I, I had a, almost a 15-year run of not being sick one day. Uh, I, my son had an ear infection and then I got it as well, some sort of buck as well with it. But other than that, um, I think it helps tremendously with skin and immunity. So temperatures um, and then different kinds of uh, digestive foods that are suboptimal are actually optimal. And then uh, exercise. So I think um, kind of somewhat varied forms of movement uh, in the extremes, be it extreme sprinting or um, different kind of um, um, heavy lifting in short spurts, I think is really powerful uh, as, a, as a way of if creating these stimuli for the body, these hormetic stressors. So those are just some examples. So lifting heavy, sprinting, hot, cold, and then various plant-based foods that are actually like irritating for the gut in small amounts. And, and I would say spices are, if you're beginning, I would recommend that one of the safest and best ways to improve health from a nutritional point of view, besides drinking water and sea salt, is actually spices. And, and having a really broad spice cabinet, fresh herbs and spices is not only making the food taste better, but it actually like has multiple positive health benefits for particularly gut health. 
Yeah, that's super powerful. I love that idea. And just this idea of that testing the body and giving your child those those foods in small amounts. I have what's called like gluten day. I do it like once a month on average or maybe even once every few months. So it's, feel it's a nice way to like sort of challenge the system a little bit, but it, 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 it's great that you put it in that hormetic stress framework. I, I want to ask a little bit more of an esoteric question now, and, and I hope the line is, is okay here, about fungi in particular, because we think of the body, we, we thought of the body as cellular. Now we've transitioned to this like bacterial idea of the body, which is sort of, we thought it was like one to 10, but it's quite similar in the amount of, of bacteria to cells. Then we, the body is also, f- f- has fungi on it as well. And we see that when we have an overgrowth, right? When we get a, a, a yeast or a rash, or we have like a, a tinea or a uh, type of thing. How do we play with this idea of the body as being partially fungi? Because we're taught that fungus is sort of bad. We don't want fungus, but how do we use fungus in the body? And do you think it's there as an important part of our existence on planet Earth to have this sort of fungus connection to to Mother Nature? Absolutely. We would not be here without fungi. So fungi and animals share a common ancestry. And there's a lot of not just cultural implications and psychedelic connections with our culture, but also physiological. So our skin and our gut are really focused on that. And a lot of common foods, anywhere from fermented foods, kimchi, shower cow, miso to like beer, wine, bread, cheeses involve fungi. So we have both with bacteria and fungi this um hopefully a synergistic relationship, but it, it could be a parasitic relationship as well in some cases. So um, they are part of us. And uh, yeah, and I think as far as we learning about human body, even in my couple decades, it just keeps expanding. And I think like electromagnetic fields and, and like things like that are another level that we're, we're not fully comprehending yet on how they work and why let's say robots and artificial intelligence are is is good at doing computing work and certain thinking but it's unable to grab a grab a mug and it's super hard for it to just grab something that is super easy for humans to do and so i think there are other species living inside of us you want to admit it or not and that there's other forces that are today are not fully able to grasp that are mostly invisible to the naked eye. So I think this is a very fascinating part of um, human exploration and also therefore ways to improve our body and our longevity by understanding our environment better. Mm, Yeah, I I totally agree. And that's a really profound uh, idea. And I'm sure challenging the people, people listening to this. One other thing I wanted to ask you about, it, it wasn't on the question deck, but I like questions that are left field. You know, there's different theories about human evolution, right? And, and you know, some more far out theories of, that are supported by archaeological evidence is that there was like advanced civilizations in this pre-Diluvian period, like pre this big Younger Dryas flood epoch and then civilization rebuilt up to where it is now. But going back further than that, how did we evolve this sort of expanded level of conscious awareness? And there's this stoned ape theory that's been popularized a little bit on sort of the Joe Rogan experience with some guests. Do you think it has any merit um, that there was, you know, higher apes in particular potentially eating functional mushrooms or even eating psychedelic mushrooms that was having an impact on the expansion of their brain and consciousness and could have led to a sort of giant leap in in, in evolutionary history? Yeah, I have an easy answer and a harder answer. If The harder answer, I I made a YouTube show there's called American Alchemy um, and it talks about panspermia and it's a little heady to explain, but I, I... I dedicated my latest book to the intergalactic spores and mushroom seeds or spores are found in every level of the atmosphere. And I, I do think they, there is an high, even scientific probability that they've impacted our culture in different ways than we today fully comprehend. Um, similarly as minerals and whatever that we today are made out of are created from a star exploding 
far, far away. So I, I'm a believer in that, even though I can't fully prove it, but I think there's some breadcrumbs there. The more simple answer, the stone ape theory and using psychedelics, I do think uh, our ancestors used them for advancement and, uh, you know, like um, neuroplasticity and things like that. I don't know if I fully buy into an immediate kind of stone ape theory as like a very dramatic form of Terence McKenna, but I think it has had part of the, part of the advancements have come from psychedelic substances. So yeah, I, I, I do believe directionally, but I don't think it's that dramatic that that was the driving force alone. Um, uh, but I do definitely think a lot of spiritual experiences were actually, um, had under the influence of psychoactive compounds of many sorts. And I think there's people mm. like Brian Murarescu, Immortality Key is a very fascinating book about, for someone who has himself not used psychedelics, about archeological discoveries and language research to kind of explain how there, there might've been, um, might've been a lot of like uh, psychedelic practices at our forefathers so I, I think i think there's a lot there and it's an interesting thought chain and if anybody's interested they can go check out the youtube show that i did uh, american alchemy or read books like brian's book on immortality key i think they're very interesting thoughts about somewhat counterintuitive to the common narrative that we're told about evolution uh, being very linear like i just don't believe in like linear evolution at all and i think there's been these massive jumps for whatever reason it may be um, similarly now that we're seeing with the internet i think like in a longer time horizon we'll look at this period as well either in positive or negative as a massive shift and jump mostly because of um, various web technologies mm. yeah absolutely agree i mean i think we're, we're seeing the birth of you know, essentially like web three or this, you know, you know, transfer of value now, which is totally different than just transfer of information and bypassing a lot of the systems that have built this whole fractional reserve banking system and the printing of money. So I think we're, we're, we're at the, the, the forefront of a huge revolution. And I think it's just been a little bit, um, got a little bit of negative PR probably just because people were speculating in, uh, in the, in the cryptocurrency markets. But back to uh, back to fungi, um, yeah, very interesting. And we'll put a link to the to that YouTube channel in the in the show notes. Um, you know, on the psychedelics thing, I mean, I see that there's so much more awareness coming for that. So, I mean, my predictions for the next ten years are, you know, psychedelics will become a big thing in terms of, of functional uh, research for certain conditions and addiction in particular we just saw some papers published on that i think that functional mushrooms and adaptogens are going to see another big upswing because they've been on the outskirts really i mean it's been all about goji berries and raw cacao and superfoods and mushrooms coming into the mix but now i think there's a whole new era of of mushrooms what other things do you think are big in the next 10 years that are that are not yet fully awoken when it comes to health improvement and, and well-being? Yeah, I think from ingestibles, I think it's very simple. Um, I think it's some of the evolutionary responses are not quick to shift. So I actually think like in nutrition and ingestibles, we're going backwards into many of those foods similar to bacteria and fungi and adaptogens. So I actually, because evolution is so slow, that a lot of those ingestibles for them to work, they often end up being more ancient things that we're kind of accustomed to using. Now, I do think there's some interesting pharmaceutical side anywhere from like the rapamycins and certain nootropics, but I think they will also be abused. So weirdly, um, I think some of those will end up biting us in the butt, but I think from nutrition, what's going to get big is I know paleo is big, but honestly, like true, true kind of like primal and ancient food systems are more um, going to be because they work. And then I think on as far as health and more progressive things, I think they are 
less ingestibles and other ways to mimic our evolutionary responses anywhere from like cold plunges that we already discussed that's a way how we elicit an, an evolutionary response into heat and temperature changes and how that impacts brown fat and whatnot so i think i mentioned electromagnetic fields i think there's a lot there that could happen um, that is very interesting um, so i think there will be ways how we mimic nature in a way of like with various tools and equipment that will then elicit uh, evolutionary build response into light temperature um yeah and electromagnetic fields so i think those are very interesting from like kind of technological tools uh, but at the end of the day when we talk about humanity most of those things are directly or indirectly still based on things that we as a human species for about 200,000 years have been accustomed to. So it's always good to remember that like to get those responses that we get from a cold plunge or adaptogen are things that have been built for a long time. And that evolution doesn't flip in one or two generations. And I'm actually really worried about things like eye health, looking at screens and things where technology is moving faster than much, much faster than evolution. And then that we need to figure out ways to battle. Like I'm wearing blue, I don't even need to wear these, but I'm wearing blue light blocking glasses and things like that. And these are a little gimmicky there. I don't know if they're there, but they do help kind of bridge the gap between modern lifestyle and, and evolution. But at the end of the day, nothing beats nature and and like and the experiences that we have there so um but yeah besides mushroom and adaptogens i think electromagnetic field would be interesting and and actually eye health now that i say it i think eye health there's a massive deterioration in eye health in the upcoming generations and the sexual health would be maybe one massive reductions in fertility and people for able to have children yeah i mean you've touched on some really big points there and i totally agree i i think light it can be so dangerous i mean i typically use blue blockers as well only when i'm not doing interviews because i, I get a lot of reflection in the light but when i'm on computers all day and i, I find that that helps a lot and you know there's so much that we can do, but we need it. Technology is this double-edged sword and David Wolf put it in a really great way. He, he told me multiple times over the years, it's going to be stone age technology. That's going to save the world. And I love that phrase because it reminds us that we are on, we are occupying a few hundred thousand old, you know, piece of equipment. We're just in this sort of technocratic reality. And so it's, how do we, we blend those two. And, I guess that probably leads nicely into a bit of a rap question here, which is like, take me through a little bit of some of the rituals that you do on a, on a daily basis, like, and maybe some of the quirky things that you do that you maybe don't share too often. Some of the things you might eat or you do in the morning, particular morning rituals. I like to hear what, what, what people are doing these days. So take me through it. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'll mention a few. I have a lot of quirky things. Um, one that I regularly mention, I nap on a nail bed. And that's something I I think I've mentioned a few times. But uh, actual nails, like metal nails. And I laid on my back actually now has some marks as well from my nap on it. <laughs> so and that's pretty radical. But that relaxes the nervous system and obviously pressures into muscles. Um, but particularly I use it for um, to get my nervous system to calm down between middle of the day. Um, so that's one thing I do. I use actual like construction earmuffs and a, and a complete blindfold. And <laughs> I do that. Um, the other thing, I don't know if that's that radical, but I do, um, I do a movement practice every day, mostly because I've had back pain since I was like 12 years old. I fought with my brother and I tore a muscle as, as if I was just entering puberty. So I have to do certain back exercises to prevent pain. And I, for example, squat. And it's funny now having a child and watching how the child squats the same way. So I stay in a squat, deep squat position uh, for, you know, minutes upon minutes, ideally like 30 minutes to an hour every day. So I think that's 
kind of weird and different um, <laughs> what I do. And then on the nutrition side, besides the mushrooms and adaptogens and kind of other, other natural substances, um, I'm pretty interested in both fasting and ways that autophage, so basically like killing or recycling cells or taking the trash out on dying cells. So I mentioned rapamycin as one of the things, uh, but there's other things, even ECGs from green tea and you know, cell energy, mitochondria related um, supplementation uh, that I take mostly for longevity purposes. Um, are, I think somewhat, somewhat interesting at least and weird. And um, I've been into nasal sprays lately. I don't know if I can fully vouch for them, but I've been taking various like herbs and supplements through nasal sprays and and it's a it's been a fun journey. <laughs> but again, I don't know if I can fully vouch for nasal spade delivery um but it surely works in certain cases mm, yeah interesting i a friend of mine and i have been experimenting with some nasal spray delivery and it's an interesting form and it and it often burns and feels strange um probably maybe thanks for sharing that last question would be what would be your favorite recipe or tonic or both uh, using some of your favorite adaptogens or functional mushrooms just to sort of land the plane on this conversation a bit. So to give people some ideas about how to, how to integrate this. Yeah. Um, I really love kind of mood um, and stress supporting and mood supporting recipes, um, particularly around chocolate or cacao. So using really dark chocolate or cacao butter and some cacao powder along with um, a milk of choice, be it not milk or real raw milk, whatever you prefer, and then heating that up a bit and then using spices. <clears throat> so turmeric, cinnamon, cardamom, a little bit of sea salt, um, sweetener of your choice, and then adding things like reishi, ashwagandha, mukuna, maybe lion's mane might be interesting, um, maybe maca, but things particularly I would say mukuna, Rishi and cacao are a fun blend with those spices. And I think you get this blissful, positive mood, mood enhancing and mood uplifting feeling uh, from that combination. So um, definitely some sort of a homemade hot chocolate um, built around cacao, Rishi and Mukuna, and then adding spices and sweeteners of your choice for additional health benefits. Awesome. I love it. Great suggestions, uh, Tara. Thanks so much for sharing your insights about functional mushrooms and functional herbs with us today. People of Food Matters community, make sure to check out his book. It's called Healing Adaptogens, the definitive guide to using super herbs and mushrooms for your body's restoration, defense, and performance. It's with my and I guess our favorite publisher, Hay House. So check it out on the Hay House website or head to Terror's site for Sigmatic, F O U R S I G M A T I C dot com to check out his incredible mushroom and coffee blends. Thanks so much for your time today, Terror. Can't wait to catch up again in person once you're out of uh, baby land and traveling again, or if I'm in Austin. Awesome. Thanks for having me on and look forward to connecting sometime soon. For everything that we've mentioned in today's episode, you can check out the show notes. There will be links and information there for you. And before I go, I just wanted to say thank you so much for taking the time to invest in yourself and be here for this podcast. If there's anybody that you can think of who could benefit from this information, please make sure to share it with them. We believe in the power of life-changing information, and it's especially powerful when it's shared from a trusted source. And finally if you could leave us a comment or make sure to subscribe to the podcast we would greatly appreciate that it helps us continue to bring you this life-changing information and make sure that you get all future podcast updates sent to you have a beautiful day and thank you once again